Um, hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here in person, live, um, with all of you and with Tori Peters. Um, two summers ago, I was here, I think in this very tent, interviewing Stephen McCauley, whom I had first met in 1985 when he published his first novel called The Object of My Affection. It was about a shocking relationship, a gay man who decides to help his woman friend raise the baby she was pregnant with. This summer, I'm here talking to a very 21st century reinvention of parenthood and everything else with Tori Peters, who's written one of the year's most celebrated and talked about novels, Detransition Baby. Um, in addition to the um, uh, acclaim that it's gotten, uh, that was just mentioned, uh, it's gotten the attention of the people who produce Grey's Anatomy, and Tori is working on the pilot for the TV show and will be a, a producer of the show. Um, and also, uh, she was on Good Morning America and part of her appearance uh, included her posting a list of um, books that were very influential to her and so I encourage you to, to look up that list and maybe we'll talk about it at the end. Uh, a book that gets this kind of attention is never going to be easy to describe and convey in a few sentences, but I think the writer Chris Krauss does it well. Quote, writing with alarming insight, Tori Peters captures the grandiose, heartfelt, and sometimes mangled as aspirations of queer and trans people facing an unprecedented array of personal choice. By showing how gender transition, like divorce or any transformative life event, can be simultaneously destabilizing and liberating, Peters makes trans culture relatable to all. A voraciously knowing, compulsively readable novel. It's the story of a trans woman, Reese, who is in her 30, 30s when she gets a call from her ex, Ames, who was a trans woman before he transitioned back to being a man. And then he unintentionally has impregnated his girlfriend, who happens to be his boss. He can't quite see himself as a father, and he asks Reese, who would love to be a mother, if she wants to consider a co-parenting arrangement. Reese is as skeptical and disbelieving at first as the reader might be. And as Tori said yesterday, that's just the first chapter. The characters in the book refer to the TV show Sex in the City and the Sex in the City problem that women looking for meaning in their lives as they get older have four choices represented by each of the characters. Find a partner, find a career, have a baby, or be a writer. Quote, every generation reinvented this formula over and over, Reese believed, blending it and twisting it, but never quite escaping it. In an interview, Tori Peters said, I think the idea that there could be a trans in the city would have been unimaginable until recently. And it's still unimaginable for people to treat trans women with the same casualness of the sex in the city women. So it's exciting, she said. There's a sort of subversive radicalism for me to be getting to do that. Thank you for being here and thank you for writing this book, which is something of a phenomenon. The publicity material says that you're one of very few trans writers published or tra trans women published by one of the five major houses. And you said somewhere that you wrote the book with three people in mind, never imagining it would have the audience it has. I think it's fair to say that the novel takes us into a world that most of us, certainly most of us here, may know very little about. And I think it's also fair to say that for all kinds of reason, it's a world that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, whether it's the right-wing bathroom wars or a more generalized discomfort because the desire to radically alter our sex or gender is unfamiliar and maybe alien to many of us. One of the achievements of the book is that it's a bridge to this world that many of us have never crossed before. And it's not exactly a feel-good, heartwarming journey but you know you've reached the other side when you get there. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you to talk about your own journey becoming a trans woman, if you would. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, this book, uh, well, it's a, it happened about 10 years after I transitioned. Um, I, I transitioned, I 
came out as trans when I was 26, and um, I, but the actually transitioning was like a slow, slow process for me of figuring out whether or not that was viable, whether or not it was what I would have to give up to do it. And um, writing and transition for me were, were very closely intertwined. Um, I thought that I couldn't be a writer if I transitioned, that nobody would publish my books, nobody would be interested in these stories. And uh, in fact, that was the case early on when I started writing. I had some essays about being trans that I sent away and uh, people weren't interested. And then uh, about, I kind of gave up on writing for about two years. And then I met a bunch of other trans women who were all writing. And the idea of that movement was that uh, we would write for each other. And something special happened when we wrote for each other. There was something that it, whereas previously, I think I was intending an audience where I had to explain myself, when I began writing for these other trans women, suddenly the story became 100%, but previously it was maybe 70% explanation, 30, I'm sorry, 70% story, 30% explanation. And when I was writing for trans women, they already knew this stuff. So suddenly it could become a 100% story. And the stories kind of took off. The other thing that happened is when I was writing for other trans women, um, the bar got a lot higher. So the things that I would say that could kind of impress readers previously, I suddenly had this, like if I talked about hormones or if I talked about what it felt like to, you know, um, go out somewhere and have somebody say something transphobic or whatever, um, that actually wasn't that interesting to the other trans women. They'd already experienced it, they knew all about it, like they'd kind of yawn at me if I talked about it, which meant that I had to bring something new to them. I had to take something like hormones or something like an experience on the street and I had to actually bring some insight to it. And what happened then is when I, when I started writing for trans women, um, I wasn't just learning how to write, I was learning how to live. I was learning how to think about this stuff in relation to that community. And uh, we started writing books for each other. Um, I ended up, my first two novellas, they were self-published. They, and it was, they were an experiment um, to try and get trans women to circulate books amongst each other. Um, and then they, uh, the experiment didn't work originally because I think people were, there was a lot of scarcity, there was a lot of difficulty. But slowly the books became kind of these cult novellas that were circulating amongst trans women in Brooklyn. And the difference, I think, culturally between 2012, when I first started doing it, and, and 2019 was the difference between Transparent happening, between Pose happening, between uh, Time Magazine's tipping point. And suddenly, uh, you know, publishers like, uh, like Random House, where I ended up, were, were looking for what are these stories? Where can we find these stories? And these, this work that not just I, but my friends were doing in Brooklyn suddenly seemed interesting to, so we actually didn't change. We'd been doing it for 10 years, but uh, places like Random House discovered us and uh, you know, then they published us. And, and in fact, the things that we were doing amongst each other, I would say, turns out that other people were interested also Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. So um, that's that was kind of my journey. Um, I've been thinking. Uh, of course, I've been thinking about your book as I've been reading it, and and thinking about it in the context of having to have a conversation with you in front of everyone, not just sort of reading it and you know reading it. Um, so. Uh, and, and I'm going to ask a question. I, I, I'm thinking about Stephen Colbert, um, who has talked about when he was a child, his, uh, he, he lost his father and a sibling, I think, in a plane crash. And he said that after that, um, he could do anything uh, funny or, you know, he, he could just be as over the top in his, in, in his, in his humor because something so profound had already happened to him, it, it didn't matter, right? And, and I hope that this doesn't sound too shrinky, but I wonder, um, you know, your book is very, um, uh, let's say, outrageous. It's very um, daring, it's very bold. It's sometimes made me think of Portnoy's complaint um, in terms of how, how out there and, and uh, unapologetic and uh, sometimes shocking it is. And, um, and I wonder if 
having transitioned, whether transitioning emboldened you to write something as bold as you've written. And I, I have no idea whether that's the case, but I just wonder. First off, uh, I appreciate any comparisons to Philip Roth. You can make more of them. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, how, how, we'll them. stick around. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I would say that there's a degree to which that's true. I, I went to Iowa beforehand, and I say that I, I wrote for, when I was at Iowa, I wrote for everybody and nobody. I was writing for, oh, this will maybe be for the New York Times. I didn't have an audience in mind. And I think when I, when I, after I transitioned, I gave up on that because people told me it wasn't going to happen. And that freed me. It, 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 it made it so that, um, you know, I stopped worrying about what, what might be outrageous or what might be shocking or what might upset people. Like, I didn't write it to provoke people. I wrote it to make my friends laugh. So, you know, a bunch of the jokes in there that, that have been cited as this is shocking or, or, or situations are shocking, it's like, these were just premises that I was like, oh, I think like my friend Morgan is really gonna get a kick out of this, you know? And, 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 and then suddenly it was on a bigger stage and it had all these political ramifications. But I was free to write whatever I wanted because the point was to make Morgan laugh, you know, not to, not to please any number of um, kind of, I don't know, like a Pulitzer committee or whatever people think. Yeah, gay, gay, gay whoever, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, th so that's really interesting, and I, I wonder, um, closer to the publication, as more and more interest developed, and the book, you know, things happened to it that you hadn't anticipated. I wonder if you, and when it when it was clear it was it was taking off in certain ways, and it would have a much bigger audience. Did you ever have a kind of like, oh shit, what have I done? Like, a, <laughs> like what's going to happen? Or or like. I, and I guess you know how if it, when it was when it wasn't just to make Morgan funny when it was like yeah. the whole world was going to see this. Yeah. Did you ever? I don't want to say have any misgivings, but because uh, I don't I don't imagine that you had misgivings. But you, like, were you really nervous about how X person or X group or X community would see you once it became much? Uh, well, I mean, I say that I wrote for three friends, but I also had this idea of. Um, that I was opening up a conversation in some ways in this particular book between cis women and trans women. That was my goal. So the book is dedicated to divorced cis women. And it was because when I was in my 30s, um, I was trying to figure out how do I make meaning. That sex in the city problem that you referenced was about how do I, how do I, how do I figure out what's next? You know, so many trans stories are about the transition. But then at the other end of the transition, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? And I started, um, I started reading a lot of books by divorced cis women, like Elena Ferrante and Rachel Cusk. And what I saw is that the trajectory of divorce, where you, you live your life a certain way and you think it's gonna go a certain way, and then there's a moment of a break or a failure or however you wanna put it, um, that happens. And then you have to start over. But you have to start over without getting bitter and without reinvesting in the illusions that brought you to that first failure. And that's actually what trans women have to do a lot of times. You, you, you thought you were you know, in one gender, oops, you know, and now you've, what did, your youth is maybe not useful to you anymore. Um, and so you had to start over. And when the book came out, there were two things. There was something that was like, oh, wow, like I wasn't expecting that group of people to read it. But on the other hand, it meant that that other group of people who, was, who I was thinking about they started reading it, and I never expected it. So I was out, you know, having these the the discussions with book groups, and like, you know, it was all Zoom, but like zooming into like Indiana with like a divorcees in Indiana, and that wasn't a conversation that I thought I was going to have, and it felt really good to actually be like, I learned so much from this experience, and actually maybe I have some things to say about gender, about the way we perform gender, about about um, the way we think about the possibilities and constraints of womanhood that could be an exchange and that that felt great so yeah a couple of people didn't like some jokes but that's everybody doesn't like you can't that's not a good joke if everybody likes it you know <clears throat> you've answered my first four <laughs> questions <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> um let's see <laughs> um 
I can always expand on them, you know. Okay, I, all right. I, well, I like we may talk. get to that. Um, one thing, we're going to talk about the content of the book in a minute, but um, let's talk about something that some of us have may have faced, uh, which is that a lot of publishers, which and then that means a lot of agents, don't, don't want to have novels with unlikable women. Yeah. And if you write novels, it's very annoying to have your agent say, you oh, know, I didn't like it when she was talking about sex with her son, because I don't know people who do that, and, and no publishers are going to like that, you know, which I've heard. Um, and, and so I'm wondering, and, and there, there's a sort of, there's been a lot written about the likable woman thing, and there are people who say that people like, women like to read books about people whom they would like to have as friends and go to yeah. a slumber party with. Um, and uh, Claire Massoud had a great answer to this question. And she said, um, Publishers Weekly asked her if she would like to be friends with the very angry woman character in her then latest novel. And she said, if you're reading to find friends, you're in deep trouble. We read to find life in all its possibilities. And um, did you ever did you ever come up against the issue of Reese being quote likable or not likable? Or I mean, did that come into your mind? Did it come into the people who were reading it, who were the gatekeepers, your agent, your editors, and so forth? And were, were there you know? Can you just talk about that? And then you know, I'll kind of ask a follow up that yeah. may be kind of related. Well, I think it's partly it's the era we're in that actually um, a lot of my agents and, and publishers, um, they came to me for a reason. You know, they came to me, so they thought that they didn't know. You know, they're like, we think that we're looking for a trans protagonist. We actually maybe don't know what's likable in a trans protagonist, and we're, and we're looking for you to answer that question. And um, when, you, when, when you say they came to you, what you mean they came to you be, when, at what point? After my novellas were circulating, um, I didn't have an agent. I was just doing this. And, uh, and an editor at one of the big presses came to me and was like, We've, you know, I read your novellas. Do you have a novel? And I happened to have a novel. So I said yes. And, um, and, then, and then he was like, well, you, you, technically, it would be a little bit unethical if I bought this without you having an agent. So I said, OK, give me an agent. And uh, that's my agent, is the one that, that, but then I didn't go with that editor, so he was really mad. But, <laughs> uh, but that, so they, that when I say that they came to me, they came to me. And, and that meant that I didn't, I wasn't so worried about compromising because um, I'd already been doing it my own way and I'd have my own audience. And, um, and that gave me the freedom to be, you know, dislikable. It gave, and I mean, I don't think I'm dislikable, yeah. but it gave me the the freedom to have characters who were dislikable to 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 talk about the things that I thought was was real. And I also think that there's a difference between, um, you know, we're not all likable all the time. Like Reese, I think, is incredibly charismatic and charming in certain moments. She's just a mess. And so it's like you, it's she's the type of person you want to hang out with for like 20 minutes until she like starts telling you about her love life. And then you're like looking for the exit, and 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 that, you know, that was already there, and I was sort of like, this is the novel, you can have it or not, um, which was you know, it's crazy actually that I had that kind of power speaking to the publishing company, company. I don't know why I call them the publishing company, uh, you know, to publishers, um, because I think a, a lot of people don't have that privilege. Well, and that kind of, as I was formulating this this question last night, uh, and like maybe this morning as I was waking up, and um, I was wondering, and this is the kind of interesting part, so publishers and maybe the world uh, has an idea of what a likable woman is, right? The woman you want to be friends with and have at your slumber party and blah, blah, blah. And... Um, but they don't have an idea for what a, what a likable trans woman is. So you could... So, and it's even okay, and, and, you know, this is a little bit cynical about publishers, but it's even okay if a trans woman isn't likable because then they can, you know, displace some of their own anxiety 
on this character, right? And say, oh, well, that's what they're like, you know. I, no, but yeah. I, I'm being very cynical about it, right? But but the but the interesting thing to me is that you didn't have to, like a, a, a likable trans woman may not be the same in 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 literature may not be the same as a likable cis straight woman in the world of publishing. Yeah, that, I think it's true um, that some people have that impression, but I you know I also think it's true that most of the difficulties that trans women go through are the same difficulties that cis women go through. Um, you know, the, the, the standards that, that, trans, that, that trans women have to uphold are the same standards that cis women have to uphold. It's, you know, uh, how you comport yourself. Do you cut people off, you know, when you talk? Like, do you, are you, all of the sort of things that made my life hard weren't, weren't necessarily about being trans, they were about suddenly having to, to deal with sexism in a very like straightforward, plain way. And I think that generally what people, you know, there are people who definitely say Reese is dislikable. You know, when it was nominated for the Women's Prize, there was a backlash and it was like this, we don't like this character, we don't like that there's a trans woman uh, in, in the UK Women's Prize. Um, but the things that they said were wrong with Reese, and those things that they said that, that Reese shouldn't be, was just a litany of the things that they say about women in general. You know, that, that she cared too much about the way she looks, or she is, you know, has sex with the wrong men, or has too much sex with the wrong men. All of this sort of normal things were, were what, what people brought to Reese. But the, the transness means that people say, oh, no, no, this isn't sexism, it's something else. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about the role of gender uh, in, in, in X, Y, Z. But really, when you look underneath it, the, what's happening is, is sexism. Uh, and I think that what the publishing industry, what this did is it allowed me a sort of opening to, 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 to address this with the publishing industry in terms that they weren't used to hearing which opened up an opportunity to sort of, I don't want to say like get something by, but, but to, to discuss it or def in a defamiliarized way, I would say. Um, what have been, I mean, I think you've, you've, uh, you've sort of talked around this or maybe talked to it, but what have been some of the most surprising reactions you've had, positive or negative, that, you know, were just things you just didn't expect or, or or that were kind of illuminating or that made you? Uh, I, I had some really, I had very interesting conversations um, across difference, I think. Like, um, I had very interesting conversations with black women about um, motherhood and the expectations of motherhood and who gets to be a mother, you know. Um, a lot of the conversations that I had with, with um, with a lot of my white friends are about the right to have an abortion or the right to a choice or these sort of things. Um, and the sort of like assumption was that you should be, that, that everybody's pressuring you to be a mother. Nobody's pressuring trans women to be a mother. Like it's, it's no one's like, we, we really want you to be raising the children. We think you're a great, uh, uh, a great role model. You know, that's not something I hear. And other people who don't hear that are like immigrants or, or, or black women or, you know, you know, and you have these things in, in, in society like, uh, you know, the myth of anchor babies or something like that, that this is an illegitimate kind of motherhood. And what was interesting to me was the conversations across that difference, the ways that actually um, the rhetoric and, and, um, and also the ways that you could talk about that stuff was like, I didn't. I borrowed partly from trans women's experiences, but there's not so many trans mothers out there. So it was, it was black women, writing by black women or writing by Latina women or, or immigrants who I was like, oh, this is what a forbidden motherhood looks like. And I can, I can borrow these structures, I can borrow these narratives, and I can be in conversation with them. Um, uh one of the main events of your book is, even though it takes place off stage, is Ames's decision to detransition. And he was a man, lived as a woman when Reese was involved with him, and then he detransitioned. Uh, and then it's his relationship with his boss, whom, we, whom he impregnates, uh, 
not realizing that he can because of the hormones he's taken. Um, it's that uh, relationship that, that propels the novel. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of, could you just talk about the issue of detransitioning and in maybe in general and in your book and, and how you made that decision? Was that decision always part of your story or did you come to it? It's obviously a great device you know, to propel the plot. I mean, I sort of, I, so there are a lot of questions there, but but it's a huge issue. And and just for people who haven't thought about this much, and I, I maybe I'm like somebody who didn't think about it that much, um, uh, you know, detransitioning is, is sometimes used by people who are anti-trans to, to say this is, a, trans, transitioning is a bad thing and look what happens. Um, and so it's a very complicated issue, but, and so here you are because I think you can talk yeah. <laughs> very uh, fully about it. Yeah, um, you know, the title, Detransition Baby, is actually, you know, unless you were like in trans community, you wouldn't know that that's actually like a, a dangerous title, but it is a dangerous title. The idea of, um, people even say like, don't use the word detransition, say multiple transition or, you know, whatever. Um, but I chose the word detransition because, and, and what, what's happened with it is it's politicized around the idea that detransitioners de prove that people were wrong about their gender, that, that you shouldn't transition because you may have regret and, and therefore you could ruin your life by transitioning. And so therefore, you know, we should have a lot of, a lot of gates up before you, before you transition. And uh, I, I wrote about a detransitioner because um, I know them, I know some, and uh, they don't detransition because they were wrong about their gender. They detransition because life as a trans woman is really hard. And, and they might not want to have given up all the things that they gave up. So they detransition. But Tori, the, can you yeah. just, uh, and I, I can, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but can you talk about the difficulties? Because I, that was really interesting as in terms of Ames's or Amy's decision to detransition when she articulated or, or the, the book articulated what the difficulties are. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think it's different for everyone. Um, and, and part of what I wanted for Ames, previously Amy, was that I also wanted her to be fallible in what she said was hard. You know, I think it's different for everybody. Um, part of what Amy's problem was that things really were hard. Um, you know, she didn't get the kind of respect that she had gotten before she transitioned. She um, never felt like she was validating her gender, but um, also, she felt sorry for herself. And that's something you get to do in fiction. Like, you, this is part of the, 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 the joy of writing a fiction is that if I was doing a, a, a political, like, hot take, I wouldn't have these characters who are fallible. But in fact, I can create a, a detransitioner in fiction, and I can have that detransitioner not be perfect. I can have her feel sorry for herself about things that, oh, actually, it's hard to be a woman, and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't know how to handle it right away, and she feels bad. But the, the other, the thing I want to say about detransition is that really it's about regret. And, and I wanted to take the idea of regret and detransition, and I wanted to take it out of a, a political context and basically say, sometimes you make choices and those choices don't work out. Maybe you move across the country for a job and the job doesn't work out. That doesn't mean that nobody should move across the country for a new job, it just means that job didn't work out. But if we say, you can't move across the country, and if you move across the country, you have to be ostracized if your job doesn't work out. Um, it's not a very good outcome. So part of what I want to do is I want to take a concept like detransition. I wanted to make it casual. I wanted to be able to say, actually, sometimes people detransition. It's not that big a deal. We go back and forth. We're, we're, all, we're all probably trying to figure out our genders in various ways. Well, you know, maybe not across the gender, but like, what's your performance? How are you going to be a man? How are you going to perform that masculinity? And maybe you tried something and it didn't work out. That doesn't mean you have to stick with it forever. It just means, okay, it didn't work out. Now we're trying something else. And by putting it in the title, by making a flawed character, a detransitioner, my hope was to make it quite casual and make it not just available to trans women, but to other people who are trying out gender performances even within the same gender that you've always had. 
have, so have you gotten uh, criticism, flack, what, how, what, however it arrives from different groups or different individuals? And has that, you know, what's that been like if you have? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I went for a while where I didn't check my Twitter. Um, it was, uh, you know, it, when it won the Women's Prize, that was, that was one group of people who were very upset. Or, sorry, I didn't win. I'm just sorry, I award myself things when I'm on stage. <laughs> When I won the uh, Pulitzer no National Booker Award and Booker, uh, it was a good time. Uh, no, but uh, when it was long listed, um, you know, there were people who were who were upset about it. But the the hard one for me, partly because of what you talked about, where I felt sort of freed through the way that I arrived at publishing, that I didn't really care what people thought about the Women's Prize, but I did care about what trans people thought and. You know, there were trans people who were like, this book is, uh, is giving away all of our secrets. It's airing all our dirty laundry. It's making us look terrible. Like, we're, you know, why did you do this? And, um, and then there were other people who were like, this is assimilationist. Like, you're, you're, you're making us palatable to the mainstream. Why, why, have you, why have you taken away our radical drive? And, you know, and as I hear them, like, really, like, back to back, you know, and um, and the the nice thing that I that I say is like look these characters are dislikable that you know sometimes they are flawed they are difficult so are you really just like these characters or maybe are we all kind of individuals and maybe it's fine for this character to be an assimilationist and this character to be like doing dis disrespectable things and it's it's, it's all it all works out and and um, and I think the the answer to this isn't like for me to have to. Uh, you know, answer to all those critics, it's for me to tell those critics, write your own book, you know? And, and I, I don't mean that even in like a, like go do it, I mean it like, please write another book because I don't want to represent all trans women. It's a quite boring thing to do. Uh, and if there's like six more out there on a stage with me, then I get to be like bitchier, I get to be cattier, I get to be funnier, I don't have to, you know, so, so please. Write books, you know. That's 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 always been my answer. Great. Okay. Um, another animating issue in the book that we haven't talked a lot about is the whole issue of Reese wanting to be a mother, and um, her desire to be a mother, uh, allowing her to consider this strange threesome relationship. And um, I guess I haven't. I haven't thought in much until reading the book about trans women wanting to be mothers. Uh, so it's an eye opener for me. Um, was that your idea from the start? Yes. Um, I, I, was, I was always interested in sort of like uh, these questions where there's not an easy answer, you know, especially when you have things, the questions of like uh, children. And, and I mean, it goes back to like King Solomon, like if there's two mothers and they both want a baby, sawing the baby in half kind of thing. It's like these, these things where, where nobody's going to get everything they want. And for me, this question of, of trans motherhood was like at, this, at the center of the story, I wanted something where not everybody was going to win because that was going to give me a kind of classic protagonist, antagonist structure in which there's a conflict and not everybody's going to come out you know, happy. Um, you, you did some interesting research around that, and I wonder, um, uh, you may have done a lot, but the one that I read about in one of your interviews uh, to get in touch with the idea or, or with the reality of being a, a, an expectant mother. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, probably the bye-bye baby scene, yeah. Um, I, so, I, you know, I have, I have friends who are mothers, and I went to different things with, with and, and I actually have a, a stepson now, uh, I'm married to Chris right there, and we have an 11 year old stepson. But at the time I wrote the book, I did not. And so a lot of my experiences with motherhood were going with other mothers to things, um, you know, and, and even other mothers who were looking for, um, you know, adopting. I went to, I went to an adoption, um, I went to a church where they were talking about here's how you adopt and whatever. But Chris and I, um, when it, the Bye Bye Baby scene was actually in a revision that I did, but Chris and I, I was she was talking about sort of like the consumer part of being a mother when you have to like buy a crib and like a baby monitor and like all this sort of stuff and the way that it's marketed and in this like very particular 
uh, ways, and I had never, never been to that. So um, I went with Chris to Bye Bye Baby, and like we just, she was like, "Here's what you're gonna need uh, to, if if you're, because she's been a mother for many years herself, but she's like, here's all the things you're gonna need, and in a certain way, having all of that material stuff, like you're gonna need." this size of shoes for the first three months, this size of shoes for the next six, you know, six months, you're gonna need, you know, and, and we made a, a list, like uh, we registered as though we were having a baby. And part of that was like bringing the material um, and just like the investment and the time into, into the story. So it wasn't, just a, it wasn't just a sort of philosophical idea of uh, what would it be like if a trans woman was a mother, but to actually be like, here's the, here's the, the day-to-day -day banal, yeah, new new socks at, at three months kind of experience. So at the other end of the Bye Bye Baby is a funeral scene. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, you know, remarkable. Um, and uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I, out of it came a joke that is like the best, the, the, the funniest thing in the book. Should I, I maybe I won't tell them. Uh, well, it's a, uh, a funeral joke, which always kill. People yeah, love Yeah, hilarious, yeah, hilarious, <laughs> hilarious. Um, but you know, it, it, it might be worth the book to, re, to get to the joke, right? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I just made it. I just, I've just done, done that advertising for you. But of course, the, um, the issue of funerals was really uh, eye-opening to me and, um, the, what, what I learned and what, what this is about is the how often trans people commit suicide. Uh -huh. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Well, it may be in the context of the book or... Sure. In the book, they, she goes to a funeral. And, you know, I've been to funerals of trans girls um, uh, more than my share. But uh, also, part of, part of this is that there's this idea that... Um, and there are there is a lot of uh, suicides and violence towards trans women, but but part of what I was I want to say playing with because it's you know it's like a joke that I really mean is that the way that that happens is that 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 then becomes the stories that everybody expects. Everybody expects if you're reading a book about a trans girl, it's going to end in a in a suicide or some sort of violent incident or something like that. And uh, part of part of what I wanted to do with with playing with something like Sex in the City. That, that's such a, a, a sort of bubbly, fun show. And I was like, I want to do something fun and bubbly with, with, with trans stories, but I also don't want to ignore that these are the other stories that everybody's expecting. And what's nice with people not knowing trans stories and having these sort of stereotyped expectations of this is how a trans story is going to end is that you can really play with the audience's expectations. You can mess with them. You can set up expectations and you can subvert them. And I actually think it's kind of a joy that that I get to do that so that, you know, if you get to a funeral scene, it might be a joke or it might be real. You don't know, you know? So um, it's, one, it's one of the advantages in, in writing in the position that I have. Um, we're wondering if people have any questions. We had a lot to talk about, so. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I think you have to go to the microphone. Yeah, okay. Um, the gentleman here. Uh, so so um, when it comes to self-publish, oh, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to self-publishing a, a novella, uh, how do you go about uh, weighing the risks and um, uh, working through the, that process? Uh, for me, it's a question of urgency. You know, I, I felt like I had a story that that I wanted to tell, and it, I didn't really care the route for it. And um, so, and I think that that's always been my 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 approach to it. Is it is that if you can find a story that is so urgent you have to tell it, there's probably going to be an audience that feels that urgency. Um, so I you know I figured out how to set it up in in InDesign, how to typeset it, how to I did my own art for the cover. And it took a, you know, I thought it was like, I, I, I published it and I thought it was going to be like, uh, sell maybe 100 copies. And um, at first it did. At first it was only like 100 copies, maybe the first six months. And then that, because, uh, you know, I didn't have the marketing budget, I couldn't put it 
in the hands of everybody who, who felt it. But the thing is, when you are telling a story that has that kind of urgency, people will give it to their friends and they'll tell, talk about it uh, with their friends, especially with the internet right now. They'll, they'll say, you know, I read this book, it meant something to me. And the, the sort of, you know, I think with, norm, with books, with major publishing, they say the big selling is the first six weeks of, of a book coming out. Um, I think when you have a story that has urgency, that big selling, it comes six months later. It comes eight months later. It comes a year later. And, and the books that we talk about, you know, something like A Little Life, those are books that people are still buying uh, four years later um, rather than in the first six months. So, um, you know, if you have an urgent story and you just put it in the right people's hands and, and, and find that audience, write to that audience, um, I think that that's where you get the energy outside of kind of marketing and, and the normal way that people position books. Thank you. Sure. So could, you could you go to the microphone? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So first of all, I wanted to say I haven't read the book, but I can't wait to. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I think you're extremely brave, courageous to put yourself out there, too. And then the real question I have is a light one, and that is when I read the title, I was wondering if it was Detransition, comma, Baby, or Detransition Baby, which I thought was kind of fun, play on words. Yeah, uh, I mean, the comma has been one of the more controversial aspects of the book, <laughs> comma placement. Comma. So it's Detransition, comma, Baby. And I, I grew up like uh, walking past one of those like Virginia Slims ads, like you've come a long way, comma, baby. like or hasta la vista, comma, baby. So I always like that, but, but additionally, it's also an extremely short summary of the book. It's like, Hemingway did a six-word story, well, I did a two-word story. So, um, so it's a short summation of the book. And then lastly, um, I really like the comma because it's, it, it's also the dilemma that I faced when I was writing the book. It's like a knife's edge, the comma, and, and I was existing on the knife's edge of the comma and I felt like I could either fall into a sort of idea of a, a legitimate womanhood, if I could have motherhood, if I could have a baby, or if I could just make myself okay with living as a man and fall towards detransition and have the sort of ease of the life that I had before I transitioned. So the comma, people are like, you should get rid of the comma. And I'm like, no, the comma, the comma is everything. It's all happening on the comma. And they're sort of like, whatever, Tori. <laughs> but but I, that's, that is my... That is my feeling about that. That the comma is the most important uh, part of the title. That's great. The comma is 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 has a sort of uh, slap in the face. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a, it's a little. Uh, pardon me. A little aggressive. Yeah. But there are. <laughs> it's the, great. No, it's great. The the I, I Publishers Weekly did a thing that this is the year of the book with titles in the comma. There's like uh, ducks, comma Newberry. There's and I think and I can't remember them all offhand. But I did it also. I was like. Uh, speak, comma, memory, Nabokov's memoir, and I was like, if Nabokov can do it, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do it too. <laughs> the next person, please. Hi, I'm Marissa. I um, I actually have a book coming out next week called Forget Prayers, comma, Bring Cake. Nice. Um, <laughs> but I, um, my, my book is a single woman's guide to grieving, uh -huh. and I'm just listening and I'm so grateful for everything you do. I worked on the show Transparent briefly, and oh, I'm just yeah. really pleased to hear you. And I'm thinking about performance of gender right now and a lot of this idea of imagination. And I know, like, for me, I made a Zola wedding website for myself um, to marry my house when uh -huh. I moved to New Orleans. And, also um, nice. But some, <laughs> it worked. But um, some people... Like, I loved at the beginning of the book when you just described the process of birth control and, like, what this, like, relationship between these yeah. two people was. And um, I know I have other friends who talk about, like, trans women who talk about fertility in a very different way than I understood it. And somebody might see that as, oh, you're imagining and you're crazy. And um, even calling, I'm, I'm just curious about those boundaries of imagination, performance, and to help some people understand just how that isn't actually, it's actually we're all imagining yeah. all the time. And I'm also just curious whether or not you see, like I've, all this time I'm thinking, I just see you as a woman. And is it, do you want to be called trans woman each time? Would you rather be called woman? And what the difference is to you, if that's... Well, I'll answer both of those and, 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 and probably take them separately. Um, the first is that in a lot of ways, I'm, I feel really lucky to, to be trans in my relationships 
partly because I have to Im I, I have to imagine uh, the ways that things feel and as a result I'm freed from it that you know I think a lot of like sexual relationships or di race relationships dynamics um, that that a lot of heterosexual couples that they, they inherit a default and they you end up sticking with that default I didn't inherit a default which meant that it was like if I want this feeling I have to invent the way to get to that feeling mm. and as a result like my I don't know I don't want overshare but I feel like the ways in which uh, the kind of like the satisfaction of the relationships I've had is that especially when I'm having them with other trans people where we're kind of like inventing we want we know we want to feel a way we've got these bodies how are we going to get to that place and as a result we kind of it's it's part of trans culture to invent the way to it and that's that I think initially seemed like a like a detriment but now I think it's it's an advantage that in my relationships I invent the way to get to how I want to feel and I know so many people who who don't they, they they don't they were never told you can just imagine imagine the way into how you want to feel there's no right way to do it there's no correct role for you there's no correct procedure and um, and, and I think that's actually part of the exchange that I think trans women and cis women are having is like, actually, here's the language, here's the lenses, here's the ways that we've imagined our, our ways into being, and, and, and please, also do it, you know, because we've borrowed so much from cis women. And then I, I basically, in terms of language, I think there's this thing where, where people are very afraid to talk to trans women because they're like, what's the right word to use for you? What's the right pronoun should we do? A pronoun circle before we talk about anything, you know, <laughs> and and um, and my feelings about this are basically like ultimately, you can tell when someone comes to you with respect, you know, that like you don't need an etiquette guide to tell when somebody's saying something uh, disrespectful, and you don't know what, you don't need an etiquette guide to tell when somebody's speaking to you with respect, and um, anybody who speaks to me with respect, I'm gonna I'm gonna hear out, and I and I. I don't really have like a, as much a, a language preference as I have a respect preference, um, and especially you know on this tour I like would talk to like a like a you know a, 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 a Bible reading grandma in the South, and I'm not going to be like excuse me, like here's what you have to read before you speak with me. You know it's like I'm going to be like, what do you have to say? What do I have to say? How are we gonna how are we gonna get together? And so, on the question of trans women and, and womanhood. Um, trans is the kind of woman that I am. And if it is relevant to the conversation to bring that up, great, and I will. Other times I'll just say woman, because I don't want to list every attribute of my womanhood. <laughs> when I am from Chicago, uh, 40 years old, you know, it's like these are, uh, it's one of many. And uh, when it's relevant, absolutely uh, happy to hear it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, sorry, well, I, I just um, I just want to remind people. I know I mentioned this. The the Good Morning America, um, um, the list of books that have meant a lot to Tori, which I yeah. think is really interesting. Do you want to just say what the books are? But I but you can get the whole list if you if you Google Good Morning America yeah. and you and Tori Peters and the book list, and it's it's a really interesting list. Um, a lot of the books you're going to already have heard of, the books like uh, Giovanni's Room, and, and so I won't tell you what that book is about because I, I bet you already know. But I'll just say one that really meant a lot to me that I, that I always talk about that's part, that's by somebody who came out of the same writing scene as I did. And that book is uh, Time is the Thing that a Body Moves Through by, by T. Fleischman on a smaller press, coffeehouse press. And... Um, uh, T's experience is a, as a, as a non-binary experience as opposed to my uh, more like binary trans womanhood experience. And as I was saying, I want as many people up here, you know, so that I'm not representing as much. So for that reason, I'm always sort of saying, read, read Clutch's, their name is Clutch, uh, casually, uh, read Clutch's book because that's going to provide a counterpoint to everything I say. You might hear that Clutch thinks that the things that I say are wrong. And, and that's part of the, the conversation I want to have. So T. Fleischman's book, which is on that Good Morning America list. 
thank you for that question. Sure. And um, we can't wait to see the TV show. And, <laughs> I and, also can't <laughs> And also the next book, whatever that is. I'm not going to say a word about that. Uh, no, but you, no, I will say that. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. No, I was thinking about what you're currently created, creating. Uh, but when I went to Tori's website because she was giving away the two novellas, um, I think that, that that has ceased because someone's going to publish the two novellas with two additional new novellas next year. I think it's yeah, Random that was, House? That was announced last week. Random House, these novellas, speaking about how self-publishing can come around. So what, five years after I self-published these and put them away for, you know, for free on the internet, Random House bought those two novellas along with two other ones and it's coming out next year. So, like, if you've got one, uh, and put it out there and, and just keep putting things out because you, that's not the normal way, but it happened. And it can, if it happened for me, it happened for you. Thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you for that beautiful intro, for the questions, and for taking all the time you did. It was really amazing.